You can just give her. You, you use that one and give her the other one. Go ahead and give her the other one now. Ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> welcome uh, to the How to Stay the Coronavirus Plague Christian Briefing, if you will, podcast number 11. Yes, this is a live podcast recording. My name is Daniel White, the third president of Gospel Light. Society International. Please join me in reading Exodus chapter 32, verses 33 to 35. Again, I'm reading these passages to help you to understand what you are in, what you are dealing with uh, right now, because you have never been in this before. No one living has been in this before. One man said today that this is the worst event in the history of the world. Uh, I'm sure he was not a Bible scholar, but uh, is that bad? And it's getting worse, and it's going to get worse. And so I want to educate you about what you're dealing with. It is called a plague. And yes, I believe it is sent from God. By the way, even Dolly Parton believes it's sent from God. And if you don't want to accept that, then and you want you want to say it comes from the devil, that's fine. But just remember, the devil can't do anything without God allowing him to do it. <clears throat> and this is primarily a punishment against God's people and God's people backing presidents to sanction, to cause the government to sanction uh, abominations such as homosexuality homosexual marriage and the homosexual agenda and homosexuals uh, adopting children and wanting to use little girls bathrooms and all this foolishness out of God's love for us also he does things like this to put a stop to things because we end up hurting ourselves Exodus chapter 32 verses 33 35 says, And the Lord <coughs> said unto Moses, <coughs> Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Therefore, now go. Lead the people unto the place of which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, mine angel shall go before thee. You need to come up a little closer. All the way. That's good. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. And the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf which Aaron made. He put a plague on them because they had already broken one of the Ten Commandments. The Bible Knowledge Commentary says about this passage, Though 
the major instigators of the golden calf were put to the sword, except for Aaron, for whom Moses interceded. Moses recognized that the nation as a whole shared the guilt. Therefore, he again entreated the Lord for atonement for their sin. And by the way, folks, that's what we need in our churches today. It just so happens that uh, we already have our atonement. We just need to go to God in the name of Jesus Christ and confess our sins and repent. Pray, seek God's face, turn from our wicked ways, and humble ourselves in the church first and uh, begin to do things that prove that we have repented. God wants some things changed. One of the things God wants changed is, for example, the Methodist church to call off splitting over the abomination of homosexuality and homosexual marriage and the homosexual agenda because that's what we have going on right now. They need to confess that is sin and we have Baptists who are separating because of this and worse than that we have lying, lying, sneaking pastors who believe it who are for homosexuality. Many of them are homosexuals themselves but they're married to a woman and they're pushing for it behind the scenes, <clears throat> trying to use their seminary education and their theology uh, to get it into the church, to allow people living in a married, so-called homosexual situation, lesbian situation, to allow them to become members of the church. <clears throat> and allowing so-called preachers to become pastors, homosexuals who are married to a same-sex individual to be pastors of churches, to adopt children and other such foolishness, and to have grown men to go into little girls' bathrooms because they feel like they are women, females. Moses told God that if he refused to forgive his people, he would prefer to have his name removed from the book God had written. That's a pastor for you. Some say this was the book of life that lists believers' names but more likely it was the census of the people. Moses' statement probably in, indicated he was willing to die a premature death. He did not want to be associated with a sinful, unforgiven people. Rejecting Moses' offer, God promised to punish the sinners by premature death. And by the way, that's what the plague is bringing all around the world tonight. Many people are dying premature deaths. I don't care if they're 60, I don't care if they're 65, 70. And I don't know what got into my lieutenant governor. I'm talking about he's uh, he's ready to sign up to die to save the economy, and everybody his age and all older people ought to get get back to work to save this economy for our children and our grandchildren. I I I I, I do not have that kind of patriotism. I'm, I'm I'm an older man now, but I feel great. I don't want to die premature death for the economy. Uh, I don't know. We need to. I don't know what what got into him. 
and he needs to stop talking and let the real governor talk. He's a lieutenant governor. Some died of a plague, and all fighting men except Joshua and Caleb died later in the desert. Thousands, ladies and gentlemen, millions have died in plagues down through the years. Brother Leonard Ravenhill said, No man is greater than his prayer life. How you doing in your prayer life, sheltering in place? He said, no man is greater than his prayer life. The pastor who is not praying is playing. The people who are not praying are straying. We have many organizers, but few agonizers. Many players. and payers, few prayers, many singers, few clingers, lots of pastors, few wrestlers, many fears, few tears, much fashion, little passion. Many interferers, few intercessors. Many writers, but few fighters. Failing here, he said, we fail everywhere. And now for our news section in this briefing. Ladies and gentlemen, according to the Daily Mail of Great Britain, the coronavirus... The death toll in the United States has increased more than to over 4,000, doubling in just three days, with more than 40% of the fatal cases coming from New York. According to the Daily Mail, UK side of Great Britain has suffered a record breaking 563 coronavirus plague deaths in a 24 hour period. And America has done the same with over a thousand deaths. And 4,324 new cases in 24 hours, taking total number of victims to 2,352, with almost 30,000 Britons known to be infected. According to CNN, the U.S. now has more than 200,000 cases of the coronavirus plague. 200,000. Fast approaching a quarter of a million. And so let me say something to you tonight, ladies and gentlemen, that you need to take this very seriously. There are thousands, yea, millions, even in the church, who still don't believe this is happening. But this is happening, people. And it's going to hit the Bible Belt, and it is hitting the Bible Belt. <clears throat> and I want you to understand, not only will pastors and Christians die, they're already dying. People are dying so fast. They can't even bury the people properly. So you need to take this seriously. You need to believe that this is happening. And all you can do is pray now. 
all you can do. And so while you're sheltering in place and looking at what other people are doing online and on TikTok and the little games people are playing and some of these people are lost and on their way to hell, God is looking to you uh, to tell them to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ before it is eternally too late. So in closing tonight, as I have shared with you, God has equipped me for years to be able to tell you how to do the home family. That is, to be uh, with your family for most of the day. Home schooling. My wife and I homeschool all of our children, all seven of our children really all the way through college. We have uh, already four college graduates. We only have three more to go. Home business. I learned that from the Mennonites. I'm not a Mennonite. But I learned how that the Mennonite, and by the way, those little Mennonites, uh, those Mennonite people rather, who you see in Walmart with uh, uh, the white little things on them, long dresses and the men have straw hats on and the white shirts and the suspenders and all of that kind of thing. Uh, let me tell you a secret about them. They are millionaires, many of them. They own companies that you know nothing about. And they have multi-million dollar companies. Some of them own companies in the top 500. Uh, but you'll never know it. And so I learned by God giving, blessing me with a divine appointment with the Mennonites. They didn't overtly teach me. I just observed some things. Uh, and I noticed that when they went, they, they had to go do mission where they never had to go out and raise money like we do in, on the Protestant side of things or the Baptist side of things, evangelical side, deputation and all of that. They just got on the plane I got some money out the bank uh, to go bless people. If they need to go build a church for a group down in uh, Mexico, they, they just get on the plane, ship the stuff down there, get the money, and go. I said, wow. But I noticed that all of the people in the Mennonite church, they all had their own business. One family, they sold honey and had bees. Another family had a farm. Another family built log cabins. Another family built the little sheds that you see all over Texas. They build little houses. Now they're building many houses. And they're millionaires. Don't have a lick of college education whatsoever. So I learned from them about the power of having a home business, a family business. And many of our dear white brothers and sisters, they've been doing it for years. They have family businesses that they pass on down, and that's why they're rich. And I, I'm here to tell you, having your own business is way better than working a job. You may not, let me tell you what uh, the owner of the Dallas Mavericks said. I forget his name tonight. I forget his name. What's his name? Say it again. Mark Cuban. I'm going to tell you what Mark Cuban said. He said it very matter of fact that he didn't bat an eye. He said, I would rather have a business making $50,000 than a job making $500,000. Yes, sir. I was going to have a business making $50,000. Because he, he knows the freedom and the liberty that you have when you have your own business. And some of you who right now, you're suffering, you're hurting, you're worried because you've been laid off of your job. Your job is gone. Now my oldest daughter, she does not live with me. My oldest two daughters, they don't live with me now. They're on their own. 
But because I taught them how to have their own business, my daughter left here. She left here with three or four businesses. But she wanted to work a job as well. And it just so happens her job is the same kind of work that I taught her to do here. And so uh, she has, she's been able to keep her job, plus she has her own businesses that she does. And it's all, she can do it all from home. Now let me just help you to understand something. If the Lord Tarris is coming, if uh, America is not cast into the abyss, because that's what I believe we're facing if the church does not confess her sins and repent. And the government doesn't do the same. America, as you know it, is going into the abyss. But if the Lord Tarris is coming and shows great mercy and grace, Senator, all the way, right here, over here. Don't don't lean up against that. Over here. Come over here some more. More. More over here. Yeah, I want you to come over here. Yeah. Yeah. And so if God tarries, the Lord's coming, and we live, and we don't go into the abyss, by the time this is all over, many people in America will never go back to a job. And so you need to be one of them. You'll be better off making $20,000 a year than having a job with people controlling you and controlling your time making a hundred thousand dollars a year and I'll deal with that more I'm not going to later I'm not going to deal with it tonight I'm going to deal with home churching the power and you must understand the home church movement has been afoot for many years many thousands of people have gotten tired of the pageant pageantry and the, and the entertainment factor about how church is today. People doing plays and shows and showing movies in church and, and uh, Super Bowl things in the church and all this kind of stuff. And so many people are sick and tired of that. And, and they started the home church movement years ago. And uh, uh, for other reasons, I did the same thing. After traveling all over the world and preaching the gospel, uh, I, I really, you know, saw some things that I just did not care for. And one of the things that I saw was that most churches, and I'm talking about Bible believing, evangelical Bible churches, Baptist churches, Baptist Bible churches, Bible Baptist churches, conservative churches. What I, what I saw was that we were the new Pharisees. We, we, we know what the Word of God says, but we've already made up our mind. <clears throat> we're going to do what we want to do. No matter. So all the churches that I was invited in, white churches, black churches, mixed churches, I could preach my heart out. But the folks had already made up their mind. One pastor told me, invited me all the way over to Europe to preach. He picked me up at the airport, and on the way back, he told me, he said, Pat, he said, Preacher, I don't even know if I want revival. He was honest. And so I was so glad when God called me off the road after I got married and so forth. And, uh, and uh, I saw so much in the church. And my main calling is an evangelist. And then by the grace of God, Amazingly, <clears throat> all this stuff started coming out. The iPhone, the Android phone, uh, podcasting, live streaming, all that. And so as those things came out, I began to see how that you can preach the gospel to the entire world right from where you are, live and on demand.
And so we took advantage of it, and by the grace of God, we ministered to and preached to millions of people. And many have heard the gospel and gotten saved. And we pray for more people now around the world than ever before. And also, I've received all kinds of invitations from all around the world to go to different lands to preach and all of that. It's amazing what God has allowed to come to pass. And so you can do home church, and you can share your home church with others. <coughs> Pardon me. You don't have to wait for Sunday. You can have church every day of your life. And you should. And you must remember that the church started in the home where they went from house to house. Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. And so we're going to deal with... Uh, the home family a little bit now and also home church and gave himself for it. I'm Dr. Thomas Constable. I've already dealt with uh, the wife uh, from the same passage and we started with the wife because that's how the uh, passage starts and it's so crucial that in the family you have order so that you can have peace you have order on your job you have order in your school you have a boss on the job you have a boss in the school and uh, the good bosses uh, normally have peace and order and they have people who submit to their leadership so you need to have that in the home in fact ladies and gentlemen I told the other crowd the same thing today the Malaysian government told the women in Malaysia because you're sheltering in now make sure you do not nag your husband and just like a wife should submit to her husband and obey her husband and not nag her husband and have a meek and quiet spirit the husband ought to love his wife as well Thomas Constable said and notice that God spoke to everybody in the family in chapter 5 and chapter 6. And maybe next week I'm going to read a quote that we read uh, in our devotions this, uh, I think it was this morning, uh, that will help you a whole lot. And Dr. Thomas Constable said, in the Greco-Roman world in which Paul lived, people recognized that wives had certain responsibilities to their husbands, but not vice versa. Paul summarized the wife's duty as submission and the husband's duty as love. And this is the agape kind of love, where you choose to love, no matter how evil or mean they might be. The word he used for love means much more than sexual passion or even family affection. It means seeking the highest good for another seeking the best for another person. Husbands are to love their wives in the same way that Christ loved the church. 
And, sir, you have to choose to do that. And the reason why there are so many divorces in the church, and that's another reason why we're in this mess tonight, is because we have a bunch of husbands and wives who are immature, who are selfish. and want to have their way, who have never grown up. Allow me to share with you a quote that we, my daughter Daniqua found for our devotions. We deal with different things. Right now we're also dealing with attitudes. How many folk in your family, you, they have a bad attitude? It's hard to live with Negroes who have a bad attitude, be it the husband, the wife, the children, teenagers especially, teenage daughters, uh, President George Bush said when his daughters hit the teenage years, he, he, he said he was not prepared, it's like they turned into little monsters, uh, get prepared for it. And boys are worse in another way. But Dr. John Maxwell said that one of the greatest things that a person can do in their lives is take responsibility for their attitude. Because once you do that, then you start growing up. <clears throat> and that's what we need in the family tonight. That's what you need in your family tonight. And some of you are single parents. Some of you are single parents. And uh, the same thing applies. I'm not a pastor, so I'm not going to get into all of that. And I told you that I was going to deal with that's good right now. I was going to deal with uh, singlehood the next time I dealt with the family. And I'll, I'll deal with that tomorrow night if the Lord Terrace is coming and I live. Uh, the extent to which, uh, so remember, remember that quote about attitude. Choose to love your family members. Choose to have a good attitude. The extent to which he went for her welfare was giving himself up in death to provide salvation for her, talking about Christ. He gave up his rights, yet maintained his responsibilities and, yes, even his authority. The biblical concept of authority emphasizes responsibility, not tyranny. Love requires an attitude of unconditional acceptance of an imperfect person, not based on her performance, but on her intrinsic worth as God's gift to her husband. That does not mean the husband cannot correct his wife and rebuke his wife. That's his job as well because we're being rebuked and corrected right now by our Lord, our husband, if you will. And God has, and, and the Lord has chastised us individually, and now he's doing it collectively. But he still loves us. And he's doing this for our good. It's all done for our good. He sees that we're way off base, way off track, and he's trying to lovingly get us back in, to get on, get us back on track. <clears throat> and you got to remember now, God showed great loving kindness and long suffering with us for many years, because foolishness in the church has been going on for many years. Foolishness and evil and 
in the family and divorce and hatred and uh, being cantankerous and all of that has been going on for years in the family and in the church. Hypocrisy has been going on in the family and the church for years. I would venture to say that over 50%, 60% maybe of pastors and, and wives and their family are fake. They're phony. It's all a show. Some of the biggest hypocrites are pastors and their wives and their little fake stuff. They just want to keep things going to keep the money coming in so they can live in a big fine house on Pope Chalk Hill off of your money. And God is sick of that foolishness. And here you don't have anything now and the church can't help you because they got to pay a, a pastor's house note for $30,000. And if you have $30,000, you can live for a whole year. <clears throat> the verbalization of this acceptance is part of loving. Love also requires sacrificial, sacrificial action. It involves doing something specifically placing the wife's needs before his own, such as doing something for her uh, that she may even hate to do. It also involves self-denial, such as giving up something he would like to do, uh, enjoy doing do something she would like to do and so forth this kind of love arises out of commitment of the will not just passing feelings a commitment of the will and most importantly a commitment to Christ that's Dr. Constable for you. But as I've told you before, this is a two-way street. The husband ought to be loving, the wife ought to be submissive. And you say, well, preacher, it seems like you're not going to get, uh, get down hard on the husbands like you dealt with the wives. No, I'm not. I'm not going to do like most of uh, your pastors have done because it's inappropriate it's, it's, it's disrespectful to the head of that household God will deal with him and uh, and, and, and I, I'm not going to join the, the pastors who have beat up on the husbands who have joined their wives in beating up on the husbands and beating them down to the ground I'm not going to do that now the husband ought to be loving, that is clear in the word, but uh, he is in charge and it's not your place and really it's not my place to beat up on your husband. Let the Lord deal with him. I'm going to tell him what the word of God says and I may not even agree with everything Dr. Constable said, uh, but I'm going to share it because I, I shared it. Uh, regarding the women. Uh, but I, I believe most husbands, listen to me very carefully, I believe most Christian husbands, they truly love their wives and they love their children. But they have been beat down so badly by the pretty Tony Pastor and uh, by the wife and by other women and by the family that he does not even uh, uh, feel like he can take control anymore. They start accusing him of being insecure and all this foolishness and beating him down and talking about him to your friends on the phone and to your pastor and all of that foolishness. 
so I'm not going to join that parade in beating up on men. Because men are in charge of their families. And uh, the wife ought to respect her husband. This is so deficient in our society today. This is so bad. I'm not going to be a part of that. I'm going, to, I'm going to share with you what the Word of God says. I'm going to share with you what Dr. Constable and others say about it. And uh, I believe every man knows what he ought to do. And I believe every man wants to love his wife and his children and does. But he also wants to be respected in his own house. And so uh, I would encourage you to do that, wives. We want peace in your home. You say, well, what is respect? It's a whole lot of things, but let me just show you a little bit. If he is trying to show you love and you blow him off, that's disrespectful. You may not see that again. Jesus is not going to take that from us. He's chastising us now for blowing him off, disrespecting him, disregarding him. So all that is disrespect. The reason why this plague is on top of our heads today is because, I think it's mostly because God, Jesus Christ, our Savior, felt disrespected by the church. No people have been more blessed like American Christians. And we have disregarded God and Jesus. We have marginalized him. We have disrespected him. We have dishonored him. We don't pray to him as we should. We don't acknowledge him as we should. Just like some of you wives don't do... Uh, do to your rather do to your husbands. Now, he ain't my daddy. No, no, he has a far more powerful role than your daddy. He's your husband. And watch this. Here's what he wants from you. Yes, you can get up. You're grown. You can go do whatever you want to do with your bad self. But here's what he wants, at least before you leave the house. Honey, darling, whatever you call them. Skeeter, whatever you call them. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to go to the store and pick up something. Do you want anything? That's not asking permission, but that's, that's respecting him as the head. <laughs> we know you've grown and bad and got your own car keys. You can go where you want to go. But show respect. Now, let me just help you. You're not going to be feeling a whole lot of love. Now, you should. You should. From your husband, if you don't respect that man. So it's a, it's a two-way street. And what, what the problem is, in most evangelical churches, we don't hear both sides. Because your husband may love you, but he's, not, he's just not going to put up with your mess. Because our husband loves us, but he's not going to put it with our mess long. He loves us very much. Jesus died for us. But he will chastise you and rebuke you if you don't do right by him. See? So, so I don't, from my reading, Dr. Constable, tonight, my beloved, I don't want you to get in your mind what most evangelical pastors teach. And that is... Uh, you, you can act any kind of way you want to act. You can embarrass him by whoring around in the church. Uh, up in the corner talking with somebody, some man all the time. Telling your business out to the church ladies and to the pastor's wife. And all that foolishness. Talking back to him in front of his children, in front of other people. Trying to make him look like a little boy.
belittling him? Well, that is not love towards you if he lets you do that and he does not rebuke you for that. Eventually, you're going to feel like you don't even have a man because he won't even stand flat foot and tell you not to do that again. So it's a two-way street. Now, let me just make it clear. Yes, he ought to love you regardless. Yes, you ought to submit to him regardless. And, and it's not contingent upon what each, each other does. You ought to submit to your husband and subject yourself to your husband and obey your husband whether he shows the love you want him to show or not. And he ought to love you unconditionally whether you submit to him or not. They're not connected because you're both going to answer to God for your behavior. You answer to God. It's about your commitment to God, to Christ. As to whether or not uh, you do what you're supposed to do. Not contingent upon whether or not he loves you the way you want to be loved. Is not contingent upon whether or not you submit to him. And uh, as far as his love for you. You need to do your job. He needs to do his. And it's not your place to try to make him do his. It's God's place. Not my place either. It's not your pastor's place. It's not your pastor's wife's place. You don't need to be telling your business about your husband to the pastor's wife or any other wo woman in the church because after a while, by and by, you're going to see those little snaky women going for your husband because they know everything about y'all. Before you know it, you're going to go home early one day and, and your pastor's wife going to be in, in the house with your husband. So shut your mouth up and uh, keep your business between you and God and your husband. And same thing for husbands. Let's pray. Holy Father God, we pray in the holy name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for all of your holy word. And Holy Father God, this is tough for many people tonight. There are some couples not speaking. There are some couples who have issues with each other. Uh, there are some couples already saying, we, we can't do this, I'm not going to do this with you. And we need to separate now. And so, Holy Father God, we pray that you will help them to see the, this as a golden opportunity to change their family life for your glory, praise, and honor. For their benefit and also for the benefit of their children help them to bite the bullet of tough love rough love marriage and uh, do what they're supposed to do whether they feel like doing it or not help them to pray together whether they want to or not help the husband to love his wife whether he feels it or not Help the wife to submit to her husband and to have a meek and quiet spirit, whether she wants to or not. Help the children then to obey their parents, whether they want to or not, so that peace can be in the home, not in a fake and phony way, but by choosing through agape love to do the right thing for your glory, your praise, and your honor, so that they can enjoy while they're sheltering in peace and quiet, love and joy. And I pray, Lord, tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ because they're going to find out real quick that uh, even when they feel there's some peace, the devil is going to jump. So help them to understand they must place upon themselves in the morning and all day long the whole arm of God. They must be sober-minded 
vigilant and watchful, and I pray that they would resist the devil that he flee from them. Rebuke and bind the devil and his demons and his host from every family that names the name of Christ. In Jesus Christ's name I pray for his sake. Amen. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you are with us tonight and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, allow me to share with you and show you how you can place your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation from the power of sin and from the punishment of sin which is hell. First, please understand that you are a sinner and that you have broken God's laws. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3 verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Please understand that because of your sins, you deserve punishment in hell. And so do I. We all deserve to go to hell. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death. This is both physical death and spiritual death. In that awful place called hell. But here is the good news. John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou you shall be saved. Notice with me the phrase, for God so loved the world. This means that if you are in this world, God loves you. No matter what you have done, God loves you. The next phrase is that he gave his only begotten son. And this refers to Jesus Christ. He is God's only begotten son. <clears throat> Who suffered, bled, and died on the cross for your sins and for mine. And he was buried and rose on the third day. Our next phrase is that whosoever believeth in him. The word whosoever means anybody at any time. The phrase believeth in him means to trust in him, to depend upon him, to rely on him, or to have faith in him for your salvation. Our next phrase, should not perish, refers to eternal punishment in a place called hell. Hell is a terrible place. Hell is a place of constant agony. Hell is a place of thirst. Hell is a place of burning. Hell is a place of an agonizing memory. And hell is a place of no return. There's no limbo. There's no purgatory. Once you go to hell, you can't get out. And then lastly, the phrase, but have everlasting life. This means to live forever in heaven with God. I told God today, I don't know why you want us, but I thank you for wanting, wanting us in heaven to be with you so much that you sent 
the only begotten Son, to die on the cross for our sins. The Bible also says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and verse 13, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou and you shalt be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Saved from what? Saved from hell. Saved to what? Saved to heaven to be with God. So, dear friend, if you are willing right now to believe in your heart on the Lord Jesus Christ for your soul's salvation, please pray with me this simple prayer and mean it from your heart. Some of you might be listening on your deathbed. Some of you have not gone to the hospital yet, but you already know you have the coronavirus and you're at home. You're trying your best not to go, but you have shortness of breath and you have to go. You need to pray this prayer with me with the breath that you have right now. It's called the sinner's prayer. Believe in your heart on the Lord Jesus Christ that he died for your sins. He paid your sin debt. He was buried and he rose on the third day. Repeat after me phrase by phrase and mean it from your heart. Holy Father God, I acknowledge that I am a sinner and that I have done evil in your sight. <clears throat> For Jesus Christ's sake, please forgive me of all of my sins. As I now believe with all of my heart on the Lord Jesus Christ, who suffered, bled, and died on the cross for my sins, was buried and rose on the third day. Lord Jesus, please come into my heart and save my soul and change my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to repent of my sins past. And to follow you in the new life. In Jesus Christ's name I pray and for his sake. Amen. Now dear friend of mine, if you believed in your heart on the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, you believe that he died on the cross for your sins was buried and rose on the third day, allow me to say to you congratulations on doing the most important thing in life, and that is trusting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. For more information to help you grow in your newfound faith in Christ, please go to gospellightsociety.com and read my pamphlet my article titled what to do after you enter through the door Jesus Christ said in John 10 9 I am the door by me if any man enter in he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture dear friend if you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior tonight please email us at dw3 at gospellightsociety.com and let us know. We have some free material that we want to send you to help you grow in the faith. Also, if you have a prayer request, please send that in as well and we will pray for you until you tell us to stop. Until next time, my beloved, God loves you, we love you, and may God bless you. Real good is my prayer. Holy Father, God, thank you for what you have done. Thank you for what you're doing. And thank you for what you will do. Help your people who are truly born again and sincere to get through this. And Lord, save those who are lost. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and for his sake. Amen. God bless you, dear friends. Until next time. Lord willing, we'll see you tomorrow.
if the Lord should tarry his coming and we live. 